All right, so here's what we're going to do. Baptism is moving to 12 o'clock. Uh, so, we'll, so Katie, yep. going to have to just make sure that we get the kids in here okay. at 12 o'clock for the baptism. Uh, okay. Children's Church is going to go on downstairs. Yeah. And that just means I can't ramble on for hours and hours on end. You've got 25 minutes. 25 minutes. You're like when you're... Just so you know, my services, my, my messages are always, almost, well, almost. They're, they're always between 42 and 45 minutes long when I put the video up. And most of the time, they're around 42 minutes almost on the button. So, so 25 minutes. We'll see how that works, right? We can do it. Those are glasses that I'm not going to need. Yeah. No time to no time to bend down and pick up those glasses. All right. Let's take a second to form my thoughts. So the story I was telling, and now I'm nervous because some of the people that might be uh, might be on on a live streaming might have been to the wedding that I, I did. I did a wedding that I delayed for an hour once. And that's the story I was telling out there. Uh, we delayed it for an hour because the mother of the bride was not there. And so they, they asked the question that they asked out there is, well, did she show up? I was like, yeah, she showed up with KFC. She was hungry. So she had stopped to get KFC. So anyway, there you go. That was a, that was a wedding. All right, but it was the bride's choice. To, I was like, hey, we could go down, we could delay. She's like, I want my mom to be here. I was like, you can do that. I want your mom to be here too. The question is, you want to go now or later? Later, okay. Did the mom bring KFC to share? No, no, no. <laughs> you would think, right? <laughs> yeah, I would also think that she would stop for KFC before the wedding. But. And it's Baptist, it's fried chicken. The fried chi it is fried chicken. That was that was possible. Of course, we did have a reception. We did have a reception immediately after the wedding. So there was food. Fried chicken, I think, as a matter of fact, in the reception. Ah, anyway, all right. So here's the deal. Uh, Romans chapter 13 kind of caps the, the, the book of Romans. It's a really, it's a good, did I say 16? 13, yeah, 13 caps of 2. <laughs> no, 16 caps it. Uh, and kind of the, the rhythm, if you want to feel out how Romans flows, is he makes an argument through the first 11-ish uh, chapters about kind of, that's where all the theology is taught, that's where the structure of salvation and, and how we're supposed to be living in, in love uh, through grace, through empowered by the Holy Spirit, uh, not not strict adherence to the law. It's grace, uh, grace in us from God that enables a new life. You know this new humanity uh, that everybody's woven together. That's everything he's teaching in the first eleven chapters. Chapter twelve then is a, like a call for us to to live that life, and that's to kind of live your life as a as a sacrifice, as a living sacrifice. That's chapter 12. And then, so almost individually, this is what, what it's like to be a believer. And then he goes through some hypotheticals. Well, what's it mean in, in social systems? You know, interactions with government and, and the such thing. That's chapter 13. And chapter 14 is like, well, what about church life? Church life is messy. How did you, how did you make it work? So that's chapter 14. Then chapter 15, he kind of uses his biography to kind of go, hey, this is... This is what it looks like. Look at my biography. This is kind of my whole biography, you know, warts and all. But that's kind of what it is. And then it comes into chapter 16. And chapter 16, it really moves all the way, totally completes his move um, from theory to practice to real life. He starts putting names and faces on it. Um, chapter 16 is a really interesting chapter uh, because it has, uh, it's in there solely because it's a real letter. If I was creating a new uh, religion, a lot of times people accuse Paul of creating Christianity uh, and sitting down and writing a, a new document for a new religion. It's like, hey, this is a new religion. I think it will take off. Uh, chapter 16 doesn't make a lot of sense because why list people? 
except for the fact that it was a real letter. And then what we see, we see some evidences by the people that are listed, some amazing truths, that this message that he's been talking about in the book of Romans is how God has already been working. So that's a neat thing. So starting off here, oh, good night. Uh, we got some names. And the names are, are going to hit both sides. They're going to be Greek, they're going to be Hebrew, they're going to be all over the place. And uh, we will see how well I do some of the pronunciations. But none of them are in there in the room, so... Nobody in the room is going to be insulted by me mispronouncing their name. But here we go. We're going to launch uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. I commend to you our sister Phoebe. Oh, that's easy. Thank, thank goodness for, the, the, for friends, right? Uh, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon in the church in uh, St. Crea. Uh, welcome her in the Lord as many as one who is worthy of honor among God's people. Help her in whatever she needs, uh, for she has been helpful to many and especially to me. Uh, give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ. In fact, they once risked their lives for me. I am thankful to them, and so are all the Gentile churches. Also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. Greet my, my dear friends. Uh, Epinetus, uh, he was the first from the province of Asia to become a follower of Christ. So right here, Paul just starts launching, uh, kind of calling out his friends, calling out his sisters, and calling out, we see deacons, we see pastors on this list. Now sometimes people, especially if you talk to people that, that don't have a believing background, but they'll come up and they'll, they'll, they're like, I read a book, and it says that Christianity hates women. So who is Paul giving that shout out to right off the bat? A, a woman, right? And then they're like, yeah, Christianity hated women in any sort of office or leadership position. Paul hated women in office leadership positions. Well, he does say that not as a preacher, but a deacon? Right there, a woman is a deacon. And then he talks about a pastoral team right there, a husband and wife pastoral team. So Paul does not seem very anti-woman. Right off the bat, when he's saying, hey, as a matter of fact, make sure you honor this woman. And in this list, you're going to see multiple women in this list. So no. The very beginning of the church included women and men. It wasn't just a men's fraternity. It was more than that. Uh, we see Phoebe. We see uh, Priscilla and Aquila. And remember, in, 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 in the book of Romans, he said, hey, you know, we should be uh, living, living our lives at sometimes living out love and, and, and living out the mission of the kingdom, uh, at, even, to the, even at peril of life. And then what Paul has done is he's calling out people that have actually done it. It's one of those ways to call people forward to something is when we say, hey, you know what, Nat, this is like when you did this, or Josie, this is like when you did this. Or Paula, this is this is when we call out those sort of things. Now I'll tell you, this is now I feel I know I don't have 25 minutes, so I can't take take all the little uh, all little side tri trips I like to take. But let me just say this: I used to cheat when I led music at one one uh, one church that I was at. I led music there, and one of the things that I did is we had background vocals that had just the voices, just the singing. One of the tracks was just singing. So what I did is I added speakers in the back of the house and played just the singing in the back of the house. So what happened is all the people that were standing heard the people behind them singing. So they assumed everybody was singing, so they sang. Isn't that sneaky? It is. It worked. That's what Paul's doing right here. He's called people out in the book of Romans and says, this is what kingdom life's going to be looking like. And he's calling out within the community. He's like, hey, Dave, this is like you doing this. And, and, and hey, Dorothy, this is like you doing this. And by calling it out, it's, it's a recognizing the community. Oh, we already have this kingdom gift. God's already working and moving powerfully. Uh, give my greetings to Mary, who has uh, worked so hard for your benefit. Again, another woman. Uh, uh, greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, who were in prison with me. Now, are we showing that, that believing might have a cost? Or in prison with me, he's, he's calling it out. Uh, they are highly respected among the apostles and became followers of Christ, 
before I did. Greet uh, am, 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 Ampliadus, uh, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ. Uh, and my dear friend Stachys, or Stachys, uh, great uh, Apelius, a good man whom Christ approves, and give my greetings to the believers from the household of uh, Stra Obolus and Herodian, my fellow Jew. <laughs> Greet the Lord's people from the household of Narcissus. That one, there you go, I got that one. Now, let me just throw this out there. Part of the reason it's a, it's a difficult list is because we've got names from all kinds of languages merged together. Remember how Paul has kind of made this argument that he woven together Jews and Gentiles? There's a new humanity, a quilt that God has woven together from all the families of all the nations. Guess what? This is it. Now, I don't know if you've picked on this, but some of these names are Jewish. Yes, some of them are Jewish, and some of them are not very Jewish. As a matter of fact, they're kind of anti-Jewish. And the fact that they're named after some... Some of the names that you see here are named after Greek gods. Now, that means that they're... I mean, that would be... I'm trying to think of what the equivalent would be. That would be like, I guess, the closest thing for... for <laughs> Christian, now I'm going to say it, and somebody's like, oh, I have a kid named Damien. But like, because we have the movie The Omen, like Damien is, it kind of becomes a name that's, or Jezebel. Or what? Or Buddha. Or there's some, some names that, that would suggest that the, the, the family from which they, they sprung did not share the same values. Or Satan. Or devil. Right? We go, oh, that doesn't sound like a good fit. But what, what Paul has said is where he says, hey, you guys have come from different traditions. He's talking about people that have come from different traditions. And that God has woven them all together. Even though they come from different worldviews, they come from different backgrounds, both Greek and, and Jewish, and all woven together. Oh, so they're real people. But more than that, folks, these guys had real struggles. These are not. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in trouble. No, it's all right. Like in America, we we have had some situations in our past, uh, some uh, problems with uh, race, some problems uh, whether or not it's up here, up northern Michigan, whether or not it's uh, violations between the native community and the and the and the people that moved here after the European communities and all this, all of these things, we have this sort of thing uh, within, within kind of generational background, right? A couple hundred years ago, somebody stole somebody's land. That sort of stuff has happened. Has happened. And we look at that and we're like, boy, it's going to be hard for us to get away with. Paul is talking about something not tens of years ago, not hundreds of years ago, but quite literally, when he says these people became believers before I did, that means... Paul had hunted them. We're not talking about something that's, that's some sort of racism that's like, it's just pervasive. We're not talking about that. We're talking about honest hurt, honest harm. We're talking about people from rival gangs that have killed each other in that generation in the same church together. Which, by the way, for us should mean that while we do have whatever, whatever stuff that we have today is so much smaller than what they have. If God can weave that group together, then whatever we got going on today can be overcome by Jesus Christ. Amen? I don't know. We're, we're talking like, you know, we talk like we got, oh, we got to do this do powerful work, or we need to do this powerful thing to, to show diversity. No, the church has always been about diversity. What we might need to do is, is uh, look in our own lives and see where we're resisting the movements of the church now. So we see legitimate, real hurt, real, real background, uh, real, there's a real context for this message. When Paul is saying, love, love your... Uh, you know, he's quoting Jesus and he's teaching about love and loving your enemy and teaching all this through this. 
He is not teaching something that is just, you know, he's not doing it from the halls of some seminary or from the halls of some, some institution where on paper he's like, you know, I think it would work great if we all just had this like golden rule and maybe we <coughs> did something different. I got this great political science theory that everything would be different if we do it this way. That's what not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about in the muddiness of real relationships. Which is back in chapter 14 where he said, or chapter 13, chapter 12, chapter 12, I was going to get there eventually. Where he says, honestly love your neighbors. When he's talking about reaching past the, the fake plastic, oh sure everything's great. And get to the real part of it, that's what he's calling us to. Give my greetings to uh, Typhi and Typhosa, uh, the Lord's workers, and my dear uh, Perseus. Right? Ooh, that's it. That's a person from Greek. <laughs> That's a Greek demigod name right there. Interesting. Uh, who has worked so hard for the Lord? Greek Rufus, whom the Lord picked out for his very own. I did research on that, by the way, for the person that asked about Rufus. Uh, and also uh, his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. Give my greetings to uh, Asyncritus, uh, Philadion, and Hermes, a Greek god. Uh, Patrobus and Hermes and the brothers and sisters who meet with them. Give my greetings to uh, Philadius, uh, Philadius and Julia and Nereus and his sisters uh, and to Olympus and all the believers who meet with them. Now we see him calling these people mother, brothers, and sisters. I'm reminded, I don't know if you remember, there's that part where, where people, where Peter asks Jesus, well, what do we get from being a believer? And he says, anybody that's given up anything for my sake, he's going to get, and here's, a, here's the, the context. And Mark, he says, uh, back there, I assure you that anyone who's given up houses or brothers or sisters, mothers or fathers or children or property for my sake, and for the good news, will receive in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. He's giving this picture right here, and you look right here what he's calling them. He's calling them brothers and sisters, not because it is a like uh, an honorific that they cover. Oh, this is brother so and so, and this is sister so and so. It's not an honorific that they just tagged on. He's legitimately saying, "Hey, I lived in their house. She fed me like a mother because." She was a mother through Jesus Christ. And he was brothers and sisters. We, we shared. I mean, he's talking about real connectedness. He's, he's putting the flesh on, on the promises. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. This is one of those. They were like, what? Okay, Rick, I was with you up until this. But what about COVID? No. What about COVID? <laughs> Not very COVID friendly. Um, all the churches of Christ send you their greetings. And now I will make one more appeal, my bro uh, brothers and sisters. Watch out for people who cause division and upset people's faith by teaching them contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ, our Lord. They are serving their own per personal interests. My, uh, by soothing talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. But, anyone, uh, but everyone knows that you are obedient to the Lord. That makes me very happy. I want you to, to be wise and, and doing right and to stay innocent of any wrong. So really, he's given us some, some do's and don'ts. Now, he said, greet us with a holy kiss. So I suppose if you want to just start smooching, I suppose that's a very literal take on it. But what I am suggesting is that what we're talking about is more than, more than merely physical contact. This is more than just a handshake. This means a legitimate uh, seeking to be intimate with other people. As Americans, we have a tendency of, of asking in our greetings, we say, hi, how are you doing? Not really caring the answer on the other end. So everybody answers fine, even though they're often not doing fine. And everybody pretends like that's real con connecting. But what he's saying is, really connect. And he's, he's asking us to do something that is going to be hard because there are going to be people. This is not a guarantee that people won't hurt you. People will hurt you. This is not guaranteeing you that you will not be betrayed by people that you trust. You will be betrayed by people you trust. You don't have the freedom to be an obedient follower of Christ and choose not to love people.
So, when we talk about freedom, when we talk about things that we can do in, in Christ, that means we get to live our life in a way that brings glory, is seeking to bring glory and honor to God. But if we are trying to be obedient, we don't have the freedom to choose certain things that are not what God has called us to do and call it good. God has told us to love our neighbor, therefore we have to love our neighbor. Told us to love our enemy, therefore we have to love our enemy. If we want to be obedient. And Paul has kind of given us this model, and he's showing it in a really hard context. Man, i got to tell you, somebody eats the last apple pie that I've been saving, you know, at the church picnic, and I'm a little upset with that. And it might be something that causes me a little bit of a, a stumbling block. It's the smallest kind of thing, but I could be so petty that something would be like this. That's not the freedom that I have. The, the, I don't have the freedom to do things that are counter to what God would have me do as part of the kingdom. And call it good. Now, yes, I could be a disobedient servant, but that's what it would be. I would be a disobedient servant. I'm not being obedient and loving. Paul is calling this, this he's raising us, this, this holy kiss thing is really this, this requirement for me to, to, to push past my mask and your mask and seek uh, real intimate connections with other believers. And then he also, at the same time, he warns us. He warns us about the danger that there are going to be people that are going to say things that we want to hear that may not be the right things for us to hear. Got to watch out for folks that cause deliberate division. And, um, you know, some of that times it's easy to turn around and say, yeah, I'm looking out for those people. But you got to remember that, that those people are us people. So that means also myself, when I get whatever my favorite thing is, I really want to make sure that this thing is blue. And somebody else goes, it's not going to be blue, it's going to be green. And you're like, I hate green. And then eventually I go, only blue people are really of God. And then we pull all the blue people together and say, see, look, well, look, I just became that divisive person. Majoring on something that's minor. Which is not in line with what Paul's guidance in 14, which is not uh, calling to be harmonious. Now, I will tell you, repeatedly, Paul has told us, he has, he has commanded us uh, through the scripture to love our neighbor. He's, he's telling us that we have to love. He's giving us this instruction because it's not an easy one to do automatically. We don't do it automatically. Christ has commanded us to do this. The Holy Spirit does empower it. But the thing that I've always struggled with is why he doesn't like compel us in a way that I can't disobey. I think that's going to be a question. I think that's going to be a question God's going to answer billions of times. As every believer comes up and goes, okay, why, now why again did you let me not, not love? And he's going to say the value of love is that it's given as an offering, that it's given as, as something like this. That's what I needed. I needed you to do something as an offering, something not of yourself, to, to, to show the loving quality that, that God does. It's a way for us to practice to be have that virtue that God has. To, to give grace through love. But it's hard. It's like, what? wouldn't it be easier for it just to be hardwired in? No. This is the thing that's not hardwired in. God wants us to love. Which means that Paul repeatedly tells us that love is the thing that has to, has to drive us. But that that love has to, is a choice. We choose love. It's not a feeling. It's not a default. It's not a, oh, this is easy. I just uh, float along the river and whichever way I'm going is where I'm going. No. He says, you will choose love. So when the the river, when the current is going this way and love is going this way, we paddle as hard as we can toward love. And that's what he's saying. Um, the, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord uh, Jesus be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, uh, sends you his greetings, as do Lucius. Uh, and he's, you know, he's the father of 
like Draco and Harry Potter. Draco. <laughs> Is it Lucius Malfoy right now? That's just for my son back there. No, Lucius, this is not that Lucius. Lucius, Jason, and Sopater, uh, my fellow Jews, uh, Ter uh, Tertius, uh, the one writing this letter for Paul, uh, sends my greetings to as one of the Lord's followers. Gaius uh, says hello to you. He is my host and also serves as the host of the whole church. Arestius, the city treasurer, sends you his greetings, as does uh, our brother uh, Cordius. Now, here is the deal. What we've seen here is a picture of the church. We've seen men, we've seen women. What we're talking about from the household, a lot of times it's shorthand for the slaves. We see slaves. The city treasurer is a high officer in the Roman court. We know that from Acts. We know they've got princes and they've got princesses that were coming to know the people in his, that were uh, related to Herod. They had everything. Diversity was just how it was woven together. It was diverse from the beginning. You know, we can, we can somehow create these homogeneous bubbles. And the only way that we can create these homogeneous bubbles is to actively oppose the spreading of the gospel. If the spreading of the gospel is to go to the nations and make disciples of all nations, then the opposite would be, don't go to the nations. Stay with your own bubble. You have to, like, dig your heels opposed to the Great Commission in order to be a homogeneous bubble. Oh, that's 12 o'clock. I had two slides. I can make it. Now, all the glory of God who is able to make you strong, uh, just as my good news says, the message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan to you Gentiles, a plan kept secret from the beginning of time. But now, as the prophets foretold us, uh, as the eternal God has commanded, this message may be known to all nations, to all Gentiles, what it says here, everywhere, so that they might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. We are closing the letter of Romans with the Great Commission. You saw it right there. He's reminding us. It is always there. The Great Commission, by the way, it's not for somebody else. It's for every believer. Every believer goes and makes disciples of all nations. There you go. So for us, if we want to do kingdom living, Layla, you ready? We are on the last slide. You're going to make it. We're going to, we're going to make it. You're, getting, you're going to get in the on-deck circle. So I want you to greet each other with a holy kiss, which means seek to have honest, intimate connections with other believers. Strive for real connections. Pass real struggles. Recognize it's going to be messy. It is going to require the power of the Holy Spirit. For that to work. The next one is to. Daddy, it's just a oh. <coughs> yes, we're not talking about baptism. <laughs> we're talking about something else. But thank you for, for trying to be there. Um, live for God's glory. Love and connect beyond the world's ability. I love the idea that, that we want to live in such a way that somebody goes, How does the only way that can happen? Try to. It's like if you've ever seen somebody that has like a rich uncle. Like they're a teacher and they're driving an amazing car. And you're like, how in the world do they have that car? They're like, oh, don't you know? They're one of those fam they're one of that family that just has a lot of money. And and people recognize that the reason that that teacher has that amazing car is because they come from a rich family. What we're saying is that you should live your life in such a way that people go, how in the world can somebody love that much? How can somebody... Uh, do that that well, and then people have to turn around and say, oh, don't you know he's one of those Christians? And the last one, we want to show his kingdom. Uh, in other words, live in unity, live the, with that diversity, that diverse picture. And in all of that, we're going to be celebrating something very similar to that. When we, when we celebrate somebody coming into the kingdom through baptism, which is going to be happening in just a couple minutes, we're going to be dunking, we're going to be accepting a young one into our church. Because she is making a statement that she believes in Christ. She's now part of it. 
with the young ones and the old ones and everybody together. Isn't it beautiful? So on that, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer first. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that, that uh, Father God, we thank you that you've sent your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, to die for us. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you uh, for your kingdom. We thank you for living this life uh, that is different, this quilt of hum new, the new humanity that is woven together uh, through fulfilling your purposes here in this world, that has been drawn together by the Holy Spirit, empowered uh, by faith given from the Holy Spirit to us uh, through the, the, the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, we can then uh, be united with Christ in his purposes, in his kingdom, and live a life that brings glory and honor to the Father. We thank you for all of that. Lord, we thank you for all these things, and we pray uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, I'm going to disappear for a second. I'm going to go in the back. So just stand by, and we're going to, we're going to hit record on the, the other thing. You ready? I always enjoy baptism. So we've been in Romans, and Romans is actually the book that talks about baptism as a picture of identifying. It's so great. You're the right height. Like you sit down and you almost baptize yourself. Very good. Fantastic. All right. So what we do is we identify with Jesus' death in the baptism. Now, this was a joke that you, you said you heard. So then, of course, I keep her under the water for three days. She said, I heard somebody say that joke. Yeah, it's there's. I just go under the water, identifying uh, in Jesus' death, and then when we come out, we identify with his resurrection, with the new life of the new humanity. That's what I'm doing. I'm very happy. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the question, and I'll pray for you, and then we'll go under. Are you good? Okay, that was the question. The question first is this one. Uh, Layla, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? All right. So, with your confession, I'm going to pray for you first. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Layla. We thank you for her decision uh, to follow you. We pray that as she goes forward in life, that you fill her strongly with your Holy Spirit. That she goes forward as a powerful woman, uh, a woman uh, like Phoebe that we just read about. A woman that, great, that deserves great honor within the church because she is a powerful woman uh, leading people to you. Lord, we thank you for the courage uh, to step forward to follow you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, which will empower her all the days of her life. We thank you for all these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Based on your confession, it is my honor to baptize you. Here you go. Right there. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll give you a blessing. I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you, that he makes his face to shine upon you, that he's gracious to you, and that he grants you peace. Amen. All right.